At the turn of the 20th century, inside an old chapel in the heart of the Begal district of Paris, there existed a theater which measured the success of their plays by how many people they could shock into fainting every night. In an era of plays and literature that were overwhelmingly dominated by supernatural horrors, this was a theater committed to writing and staging shows which depicted the most brutal, gory, and realistic kind of horrors they could possibly depict on stage for their live audience. Its fans included Ho Chi Minh, Winston Churchill, and Anise Nin. The Romanian King Carol II adored the theater so that he had his own bedroom in the back of the theater, where he and his mistress would make love during the performances, and they would rarely be the only audience members doing so. This was a theater devoted to the most primal and debauched kind of human experience. This was a revolutionary rejection of bourgeois theater and its morals, as well as its audience. This was a theater of blood and torture, sexuality and intimacy, of horror and madness. This was the Grand Guignon. And it started, appropriately enough, with a chapel being assaulted. The building that would eventually become La Théâtre du Grand Guignon started life in the 1700s as part of a convent, with the construction reaching completion just in time for the anti-clerical fervor of the Reign of Terror to sweep through the city. After the clergy had been expelled and the building sacked and gutted, it was then passed back and forth between owners and purposes before eventually being purchased in 1897 by Oscar Metinier. Metinier is a fascinating person in his own right. He was a tabloid journalist turned novelist who is known to have, on at least one occasion, invited a friend to attend an execution for fun. His writings were part of the French naturalist movement, with stories often set among vagabonds, drunkards, and prostitutes. Indeed, when Metinier began penning plays, he would eventually write the first French play to include a character who was a prostitute. Additionally, prior to founding the Grand Guignol, he'd helped establish the Théâtre Libre, a theater led by André Antoine, with the specific goal of performing plays that were otherwise deemed too controversial by more established theaters. Alongside these risky plays, they would also write and stage one-act pseudo-documentary plays known as Comédies Rousse, translated as bitter or cynical comedies, though they were most certainly not comedies as we'd think of them. These plays told often tragic stories ripped straight from the headlines, bringing the world of crime, addiction, and violence to the stage for their upper-class audience. The Teatre Libre would then stage these plays in a naturalistic style, a style where they'd attempt to make everything feel as grounded and real as possible, up to and including using every means at their disposal to depict the most grisly details of the crimes they were portraying. Given Metinier's tabloid history, it is perhaps unsurprising that he would be responsible for penning several of these comedies roles, which would go on to find more success than any of his early novels, in no small part due to the controversy around their most sensationalist aspects. When the Teatre Libre shut down in 1896, Metinier recognized his opportunity. In 1897, Metinier took the basic business model and creative inspiration behind the Teatre Libre to a theater he'd purchased to put on his own plays. And thus, the Grand Guignol was born. Grand Guignol roughly translates as The Big Puppet, or Puppet Show for Adults. And that was the original idea behind the theater itself, to create an adult puppet show, sometimes with literal puppets, some with actors treated as oversized puppets, all in order to get the audience to react with the kind of extreme emotions most often reserved for children. To this end, they would put on five to six short plays of contrasting genres every night in order to create a unique style of presentation. They'd alternate between shocking comedies roasts, traditional comedies, slice-of-life plays about working-class Parisians, and so on, in a deliberate attempt at creating emotional whiplash which they refer to as hot and cold showers. 
this type of experience quickly found a small but fervent audience. Maintaining and growing the audience night after night proved to be too much for Metinier, however. And just over a year after founding it, he sold the Grand Guignol to Max Murray. It wouldn't be long before Murray would take the general hot and cold approach of shows that the theater was renowned for and transform it into something noticeably more... sensational. The comedies and slice of life plays were swiftly replaced with sex farces ripe with nudity and, most famously, gory horror shows that depicted the most extreme kinds of violence. It was Murray who would infamously measure the success of her performance by how many people fainted over the course of an evening. And, more often than not, they succeeded. On average, two people would lose consciousness over the course of each night, though it was not unheard of for up to 15 people to pass out at the intensity of the performance. Murray would often have a contracted doctor in the wings to treat patrons suffering from the most intense kinds of shock though this was likely done more as a marketing stunt than out of any kind of medical necessity. These performances would feature explicit scenes with what would be considered intense violence and gore, even by modern standards. This includes scenes of women having their faces disfigured with fire, graphic scenes of torture and essay, the murder of children, amputations, brain surgeries and lobotomies, just to name a few. These scenes would then be brought to life with an array of special effects. There was almost always at least one vat of fake blood backstage. Actors would chew soap to simulate rabies. For scenes of slow slicing and stabbings, they would use retractable stage weapons that simulated bleeding. It was not uncommon for the stage to integrate the flesh and limbs of slaughtered animals for maximum authenticity, particularly in scenes where skin was to be peeled off. Eye gouging was a particular favorite. The legendary Andre Delord, known in his time as the Prince of Fear for having pinned over 150 horror plays, had been led to believe by his personal psychologist and co-writer that such an act was an adequate and universal emotional substitute for the fear of being castrated. As such, it found its way onto the Grand Guignol stage with alarming regularity. Fun fact. That psychologist was Alfred Binet, the inventor of the first IQ test. He sucks. With this shift into horror, the Grand Guignol had begun to take the shape that would come to define its legacy. As one critic described it, the theater had moved away from slice of life onto slice of death plays. Due to the short nature of these plays, they needed to be efficient with how they told their stories. As such, a general format emerged. The plays would often open with characters expositing the backstories of themselves or the main cast, often foreshadowing why one just might be capable of extreme violence or sadism. Something would then happen that would leave the perpetrator alone with their victim or victims. The murderer would then slowly but surely execute their target, often in a way that dragged out the proceedings for dramatic effect. One perfect example of this would be the ironically named the Nutcracker Suite, written by Elliot Crochet Williams and first performed in 1922. The play opens with two lovers, Max and Rosalie, lounging together half-dressed in a chateau as Rosalie plays a song on the piano from Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite, using sheet music Max had gifted to her. They kiss before it's revealed that Rosalie is actually married and her husband, Nicholas, has unexpectedly returned. Max runs out, Nicholas enters, Rosalie acts distant and weird, Nicholas is clearly suspicious as he begins dropping hints that he knows what she's been up to. Nicholas finds the sheet music, gets it out of her that Max gave it to her, whereupon he clearly knows what's up, particularly after the maid just straight up tells him everything after he promises to marry her. Fast forward, Max and Rosalie are staying at an inn as they attempt to flee together. It is revealed, however, that Nicholas has used an insidious plan to lure Max and Rosalie into this specific room, which he had personally designed and dubbed the Nutcracker Suite. From there, he explains his plan through a barred window and- Oh, hey, did the ceiling just move? You are a devil. A madman. Really, Rosalie? 
I'm surprised at your lack of appreciation of all I have done to please your taste in art. But we wander. Let us return to the point. My little nutcracker, pray let me call your attention to the exquisite delicacy of my little nutcracker. Really, it is worthy of the sweet, and I pride myself on having contrived it out of my own knowledge of engineering. With a little help. A minimum of help. In these matters, the less help, the better. So, the credit is almost entirely my own. He stoops a little, but still looks in through the window. Observe! In addition to the main mechanism, I have provided this little subsidiary lever, which I hold in my hand now. A slight turn. He turns it. And the ceiling, perhaps I ought to say the upper claw of the nutcracker, rises an inch. The ceiling rises a little. Max springs towards the door. But with another slight turn, it falls again. Very disappointing, that other slight turn, I'm afraid. But a life's like that, isn't it? You fiend. Oh no, not a fiend. Just a disappointed, unmusical husband trying to please his musical wife and the musical young gentleman she prefers by a performance of the Nutcracker Suite. Rosalie raises herself up. (laughs) Nicholas! For the sake of old times. Old times, very old times. Now watch the ceiling come a little lower for the sake of new times. He turns the lever and the ceiling drops a few inches. Max takes Rosalie in his arms. God! I'm afraid God won't interfere, Max. Why should he? No, I've got the field to myself. I think I need elaborate no further on my little invention. I will merely add that there is two tons of weight on top of the ceiling and a stone floor underneath you. Your imaginations will, no doubt, supply the rest. And now I'll leave you. Leave you to your own meditations. And oh, I've still one little surprise for you. A little aesthetic surprise. Not very choice, perhaps, but then I'm not a musical man like Max. Nicholas sees Max start to speak. Oh, don't be impatient. You'll see what my other little surprise is in a very short time. He turns to go. Well, goodbye. Or perhaps only au revoir. I may meet you both again sometime, somewhere. Meanwhile, let me wish you a very good night. No, that's a little inadequate under the circumstances. I wish you a very good eternity. He bows, smiles, and goes. For a moment, Max and Rosalie look at one another in silence. Then Rosalie jumps up, runs to the window, and, looking out through it, cries despairingly after Nicholas. Nicholas! Nicholas! But there is no answer. Rosalie listens for a moment, and then returns, horror in her eyes to Max. Another surprise. He said another surprise. The ceiling commences to again descend slowly. Rosalie sees it full. (laughs) I can't stand it. I can't stand it. She begins to cower and turns to Max. I shall go mad. Blind me. Oh, Max, kill me. Shh, no, no. Be brave. One must be able to meet death with one's eyes open. By modern eyes, these plays would be identified as melodramas. When most people hear the term melodrama these days, they tend to think of soap opera-esque overacting and hysterics, which is not wrong, but not quite right either. Historically, melodramas were hyper-emotional plays with themes topically relevant to the time they were released that would then be accompanied by live orchestras who would often perform dramatic music in time with the story. Even the name itself is reflective of its relationship with music, with mellow being Greek for music, and drama being, well, drama. On a narrative level, melodramas prioritize bombastic and straightforward plots with happy endings starring clear villains, victims, and heroes to tell reassuring moral tales. It's a genre that would take realistic depictions of the world and then heighten them with depictions of extreme feelings, extreme conflicts, and extreme tragedy. 
all with the intent of offering the audience an uncomplicated yet intense experience. Though, notably, while still doing its best to avoid becoming camp in the way that we'd think of melodrama today. Think less Days of Our Lives, and more Sweeney Todd. Less DMC Devil May Cry, more Devil May Cry 3. Yes, I went there, because, if it isn't apparent yet, melodrama is not an inherently bad genre. Indeed, many of the most popular works of art in the modern day would fall under its umbrella. Melodrama is, however, an inherently exaggerated and hyperbolized genre. And, as such, it being used to shock and horrify audiences was likely inevitable. It is worth noting, though, that for the majority of the Grand Guignol's life, its performers never delivered their stories with even an ounce of campiness. These over-the-top characters were played as realistic as possible, often to disturbing effect. The company of the Grand Guignol had found a way to exaggerate melodrama even further, though. Namely by doing away with the compulsory happy endings and replacing them with its trademark brand of extreme violence, while still holding on to melodrama's focus on topical stories and morality tales. All of this sensationalism was further heightened by the design of the building itself. In the midst of all this violence and terror, the building's history as a chapel would begin to find a second life. Though not in the way that the clergy who created it would hope. While there are few images that have survived of what the Grand Guignol looked like at its height, there are no shortage of descriptions from former theatergoers. Old Christian murals looked over the audience and stage alike. Statues of angels hung over the orchestra as they performed dramatic stings and ambient sounds. These statues would, on occasion, begin to shed tears. To the average patron, it seemed almost supernatural. To those with knowledge of theater, they may have assumed it was a tasteful special effect. In reality, the roof simply had a leak which Murray opted not to fix, both for the sake of ambiance and frugality. The room itself was the smallest professional venue in Paris, with only 293 seats. A fact that was often weaponized by its performers and writers to inspire a sense of claustrophobia. This is in no small part of why many of its plays were set in confined environments, often isolated from the world at large, such as asylum cells, operating theaters, and opium dens. The scent of incense hung in the air and weaved itself into the furniture. All of this led to the venue having a distinctly gothic, almost religious atmosphere, even by the standards of the time. One patron described entering the theater as like plunging into a tomb. It wasn't all doom and gloom, however. The theater boxes were made out of converted confessionals, which allowed its occupants to watch the show through a mesh grating without being seen by others. This freed the more faint-hearted to avert their eyes without being branded as cowards. And the more courageous to engage in some risque behavior sight unseen during the sex-filled comedies. Wink, wink. The boxes did not, however, deafen noise, resulting in the most vocally amorous patrons forcing the actors to break character to directly ask them, Have you finished yet? This is so fucking stupid, dude. Holy shit. I hate, I hate theater. I hate history. I hate everything. In spite of the lewd behavior, or maybe because of it, the theater went on to find continuous success for the next 16 years that Murray was in charge of it, before he would hand over the keys to financial manager Charles Zabel and the new director, Camille Choisy. While Choisy had never managed a theater before, he was a seasoned actor with an extensive history in stagecraft. Choisy would use this knowledge to improve the lighting, set design, and staging of the Guignol's performances. Most famously, though, he would go on to refine the gory special effects that allowed the actors to inflict violence upon each other with more fidelity than Paris had ever seen. In an attempt to keep up with the horrors of World War I happening only a couple hundred kilometers away, Choisy encouraged his writers to move away from more overplayed versions of disposing of a character and find more creative solutions. The theater moved from blades and nooses towards electricity, acid, dismemberment, peeling of skin, being eaten alive, and many, many, many more. The eye gougings in particular saw a sharp increase in fidelity, pun not intended, 
Longtime Grand Guignol performer Paula Maxo would often portray the victim of this violence. By the end of her tenure in the 1930s, she estimated that she had been murdered over 10,000 times, in at least 60 different ways, earning her the title of the most assassinated woman in the world, with it all brought to life by Choicey's advancements in special effects. The realism that had founded the theater had officially faded and been thoroughly replaced with expressionism and shock. Lesson number one, my friends. Always catch your audience. Involvement, the number one priority in all good theater. In 1930, though, Charles Zabel sold his stake in the theater to Jack Jovin. And while he had lofty aspirations, it is difficult not to view him as the one responsible for the theater's slow but steady decline. Jovin would go on to retire many of the old scripts that had brought the theater its initial success before he began moving away from splatter plays and nudity-laced comedies into his preferred genre of psychological drama and erotic thriller. Audiences, however, were not eager to follow. And without the spectacle of horror to shock and comedies to soothe patrons each night, attendance began to wane. Additionally, Jovin was unable to build a good working relationship with Camille Choisy, who would also leave the theater in 1930, followed a few years later by the aging Paula Maxa. Jack Jovin would ultimately move on from the theater in 1938, while handing off the keys to an English woman named Ava Berkson. Just over a year after the theater found its new owner, though, Berkson was forced to retreat back to England when Paris was occupied in 1940 because of you know, reasons. German reasons that would get this video demonetized. On her way out, though, Berkson had re-enlisted Camille Choisy as the theater's director. He, in turn, brought back Paula Maxa alongside several other former theater members, and, with their help, the theater troupe began to revive the classic repertoire. This did, in fact, briefly work. Unfortunately, though, many of the most regular patrons it attracted were the occupying forces. One rumor even claimed that Hermann Goering was known to be an attendee. However, between the changing cultural tides, the tension brought about by the aftermath of the war, and Max's voice which had long since been damaged as a result of decades of blood-curdling screams, it was all ultimately too little, too late. Ava Berkson would return to France in 1946, before fleeing again in 1952, this time to avoid debt collectors. The Grand Guignol dropped its final curtain in 1962. Its last director, Charles Nonon, was quick to attribute the closing to the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust. In a final interview with Time magazine, Nonon stated, We could never equal Buchenwald. Adding that, before the war, everyone felt that what was happening on stage was impossible. Now, we know that these things, and worse, are possible in reality. It seemed to many of its nostalgic fans that the horror theater had been outperformed by the horrors provided by the real world. And with an audience fatigued and numbed by the violence many had lived through, the Grand Guignol had been left little choice but to slowly wither away. In my personal opinion, however, I can't say I agree with that evaluation. The theater reached the peak of its popularity between World War I and World War II, and while the latter was undeniably gruesome beyond comprehension, the Great War wasn't exactly a humane conflict bereft of nightmarish imagery. Additionally, the theater's general decline just so happens to begin around the moment the talkies began to enter the genre of horror itself, with classics such as Todd Browning's Dracula and James Whale's Frankenstein. This is also why I wouldn't personally pin the decline of the theater entirely on Jack Jovin, misguided though he was. What's more, given that Hitchcock's legendary transphobic slasher, Psycho, had been released to overwhelming success a mere two years prior to the theater's closure, and that Romero's gory genre definer, Night of the Living Dead, was set to arrive six years later in 1968, I'm skeptical that audiences had lost their appetite for shock and terror. 
Rather, I think it's safe to say that they had found somewhere else that would show it to them with much more detail, intimacy, and convenience. It also doesn't help that the plays they were putting on by the end were just... kinda bad? I'm talking some real style over substance shock jock shock. Just pure gore for gore's sake. Cool if you're into that sort of thing, but, well, most aren't. Regardless of what brought about its final demise, though, its legacy lives on. The Grand Guignol's most obvious progeny are the deliberately controversial splatter films such as Cannibal Holocaust, as well as torture films such as the Saw and Hostel series. However, the theater's influence extends far beyond just the blood and gore. The theater's trademark blending of topical morality and shocking violence can be seen all throughout horror and its many subgenres to this day. From Halloween, to The Thing, to Alien, to Sweeney Todd, to Resident Evil, and so, so much more. Oh my god, I should have made the script about how Resident Evil is basically just an interactive Grand Guignol play. Such a missed opportunity. Perhaps most importantly though, many of the plays that originated from the Grand Guignol still continue to find new life, with several modern theater troupes staging their own takes on the gruesome classics to this day. As for the theater itself, the old church which once housed the Grand Guignol does fortunately remain. Now, nestled in the heart of Paris's Pigalle district, where you could once find nightly displays of viscera, you can instead find the International Visual Theater, a company which specializes in putting on plays entirely in sign language. I've been your host, Ruby Ann Seals. Thank you for watching. Hi, Ruby here again. Hope you enjoyed. Try not something new for the channel. If you'd like to see more theater history content like this, be sure to drop a like and leave a comment to let me know. Had a lot of fun putting this together and have a lot of other topics I know I could info dump about, but it helps to know that there are people who are actually eager to see it. I am fueled by audience demand. And if you really liked it, then please consider supporting the show over on Patreon. Much like the Grand Guignol itself, we too are reliant on our incredible patrons to help us keep the lights on as we put out more experimental episodes like this. And as little as a couple dollars a month does a great deal to help us out. And in return, you'll be able to get updates on what we're planning next, previews on our biggest projects, and your name in the credits. Special thanks to our guest editor, Zanshill, for doing such an incredible job on the visuals for this project. If you're in the market for an editor, then be sure to hit her up. And, as always, thank you to our fine patrons, who make all of this possible. Incredible people such as Spencer Burton, Archaeopteri Gide, Alex Shemp, Patrick Salisbury, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, Black May Jap, Sebastian Cordoba, Holfer, Floofy, Sad Fox, Phoenix, Christopher Moore, Ashame Spork, Jeanette Ng, Sunny Side Up, Lilith Luna Lovecraft, Scarlet Booth, Dartilius Rayard, Eldritch Kool Aid, Mary Koser, Duragus, Moth, Random Key Sin, Some Moose, CK Noir, Taylor Thomas, Shibe, Liliana, Crushable Door, Leon DeBoa, Brody Bones, Ida, Cloud, and everyone else currently helping out over on Patreon. Thank you all so much. Have some more theater content planned in the short term, some pathologic content planned in the midterm, and something really special planned in the long term. Can't wait for y'all to see it. Till then, thank you all one last time for watching. Love y'all. Peace.